so I was brought up in England, decided I wanted to be an industrial designer, and I went to study um, design at the Central School in London. My first projects were things like toasters and you know, everyday consumer products. My expectation was that I would continue to design objects manufactured in metals and plastics for the rest of my life. In the 70s, I got the opportunity to design both telephones and computers. And so once you start designing those products that have technology as part of them, then you feel, oh, I need to design the way they behave completely. So I found myself creating interaction design. Everything that can be digital will be. Digital technology seems to be everywhere. I had the opportunity to work on this first laptop in uh, 1970 and 1980, uh, 1979 and 1980. And at that time, computers that were supposed to be portable were in big suitcases with a tiny little screen at the top. And I must say, it was a huge thrill to have the opportunity to do something so ineffective. We, we developed a magnesium case for the housing to make it possible to drop it and not damage it. And I remember very clearly the first day that I had a working prototype, which was at the end of 80 or early 81, and I took it back and said, OK, now is my chance to use the product I designed. And for the first minute and a half or two minutes, I was very proud of myself because I was noticing the fact that as I opened it, it felt good and I could see all the details of the design. But after the first three or four minutes, I found myself getting completely absorbed by the relationship I had with the software, with what was happening down behind the screen. I felt myself kind of sucked down into it, where I was only interested in making the keystrokes, steering it, and the software interactions. And I completely forgot about my physical design. And the stuff that I hadn't designed lasted the whole day. The stuff that I had designed lasted five minutes. At that point, I knew I had to learn how to do interaction design. I was lucky enough to be able to get Bill of a Plank, who was a well-known guru at the time from Xerox, to join me in the mid-80s to help us to establish a way of doing interaction design. And so here he is explaining what he means by interaction design and illustrating it as he goes. Um, I'm going to start with the definition of uh, interaction design. Focusing on design for people. Interaction designer has three questions to answer. They're all how do you questions. The first question is how do you do? How do you affect the world? And I think of a simple choice there between uh, handles and buttons. So I can deal with the world by pushing buttons or I can grab a hold of the world and manipulate it or grab a hold of a product and turn it or twist it. This is the handle world. It's the world of continuous control. The buttons are the world of discrete control. The second question is, how do you feel? This is, how do we get feedback from the world? There I like McLuhan's distinction between uh, what he called fuzzy or cool media and hot or distinct, um, cool and hot. Cool media draw you in. Finally, the third question is, how do you know? And um, as we design interactions with computers in them, it's very difficult for the user of those products to know exactly what they're going to do. And a nice dichotomy is deciding whether the user needs a map to see an overview of how everything works, uh, or maybe the user just needs to know exactly what to do moment to moment and a path is sufficient. Do this, do this, do this, do this. So those are the three basic things that happen in an interaction. I think the internet really is changing everything. You know, the connectivity, the way they can connect it together, whether it's wire or wireless, the fact that it's there is really making an incredible difference to everybody's life. And who is the most interesting innovator in the internet? Well, of course, it's Google. 
The amazing thing about Google is that they're such a simple design. They really managed to do something which doesn't seem cluttered. It seems very easy to use. It gives you an answer incredibly quickly. We said, oh, we should just go out and start a company. And we, we developed this thing called PageRank, which lets you uh, determine the importance of pages based on the links to them. You start with the web page. Actually, we used to start with my home page. <laughs> and uh, you just follow the links. So it's like you're surfing, but you, you, know, you just follow the links from that page. And you keep doing that until you have the whole web. I designed the page, and you know, I wasn't you know, about to spend a lot of time on it. So I just put a search box in there, and the search button, and the logo. And that was it. Eventually, we added a little bit of stuff about the company. Um, but it was still quite small and compact. And we realized how powerful that was because it actually matters when you when you go to the home page of a search engine. You know, you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to find the search box. Um, you really want people to come there and then be able to right away use it for what they want. And after that, we made a conscious decision that we were going to, in fact, take things off that page. So we've added a lot of services. Um, it's been it's a design challenge to add services without increasing the complexity. And we like to say we're we're focused on the ultimate search engine. And the ultimate search engine would basically understand everything on the web. It would understand um, exactly what you wanted. It would give you the right thing or the right things. So thinking about the way the web is changing, the internet is changing, I think it's interesting to think about this historical analysis, which was made by Terry Winograd. If you look at the way people have used computers, they come in three different styles, conversation, locomotion and manipulation. The early computers, you know, you had punch cards or pieces of punch tape and you put something on there that you wanted to ask the computer. Then you put it into the machine, you waited, and the computer did its thing and then it gave you an answer back. So it's like a slow motion conversation. Then the revolution was the idea of the desktop metaphor on the mouse. You can grab things, you can open a file by clicking on a folder or dragging and dropping something. That is manipulation. When the web first started, it happened in a way where you opened a file by thinking that you were going to it. You went onto the web, you found a page, and then you read it. Locomotion. You went through this invisible space. I think what we're seeing now with Web 2.0 is more and more possibility of using all those three metaphors together. So when you go to a page on the web, it's now more likely that you'll be able to use something directly there, manipulate it, and also perhaps have a conversation with other people when you're there. So the three um, metaphors of the history of computing are probably coming together in the future of the web. Um, there's been a lot of promise from uh, things like uh, handwriting recognition and voice recognition that's been frustrating. It really hasn't happened because the mind is so sophisticated. But I think what we're seeing now is a sudden change in terms of the nature of input. Take the iPhone and you've got gestural interface. You're able to flick it and use your fingers in an interactive way that's very different from moving a mouse around. And a couple of weeks ago, um, there was an um, exhibition in um, San Francisco I didn't go to, but I saw this announced in the paper, that uh, at last we have a brainwave measuring device which is cheap enough to be used for gaming. And it measures the brain waves in your head. Now it's come down to the point where you actually can measure your brain waves enough to be able to think your way through a space, a virtual space. So maybe we won't need anything physical at all as we move into the future. Thank you.